Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Pearls and Politics Podcast, where we are polished and poised for greatness and impact. Thank you so much for joining us today. As we all know, it is October. And what is October? Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And here at Pros and Politics Podcast, we endeavor for everyone to be healthy in mind, body, soul, and spirit. So today, we are starting our series on breast cancer and breast cancer awareness with our very special guest, Dr. Kanisha Bryant. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. This has been, um, we've been working on this for a while. Obviously, we've been talking about it for months because what only very few people know that are watching today, Dr. Bryant is my best friend. And she is one of three best or four, well, three best friends that I have. It's four of us mm -hmm. and the two C's and the two K's. And Dr. Bryant has been a part of Pearls and Politics podcast from its inception in yes. my, my, my belly. And so she has been so instrumental in helping me navigate, brainstorm, just all those things. And so we said from the very beginning, I was like, oh, the month of October, you have to come and you have to share your wisdom, your knowledge and your expertise with our listening and viewing audience about all things breast cancer and awareness. So thank you so much for your friendship and for coming on today. Well, thank you. Um, I am so very elated to be here. Um, like before we even really get started, I just want to say that, you know, I am so very deeply proud of you and all that you have accomplished, all the things that you have gone through and how you have been through it and accomplished everything with such grace and poise and beauty. And I just want to say, I'm so proud of my best friend. Yeah, like y'all don't understand. <laughs> this is my best friend and I am so proud of you. And I, you know, want to say that to see all of this, you know, you know, I saw it in seed form mm -hmm. and now to watch it come full <laughs> to full fruition, like it's just amazing and you're amazing and i want to say i'm so proud of you and all that you've accomplished again and so i know that it's just going to do nothing but grow and become better and better and better as you have always so thank, thank you. you for thank having you. me so much that means so much um because you know we always ask everybody how do we know each other <laughs> so we have been best friends since we were 15 years old so there has been, years. yes, 30 years this year, because literal you know, years. we will be 45 <laughs> this year and it's all good. And so, um, Chassie, Christy, Kanisha and Kahala, the wild bunch, as my father called mm -hmm. us, we've been in this thing for 30 years this year. And so that's how we know each other. And we've been through everything together. We've all been pregnant together, got married together, finished school together, got licensed together. Like we've experienced some of the most uh, unfortunate of times together. Say great gains and great losses. Absolutely. So that's how we know each other. So I understand that it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and that's you know we do pink here, pros and politics <laughs> podcast anyway. But we're uh, super pink today. But are you a member of a Greek letter organization, Dr. Um, Bryant? Yes, I happen to be a Silver Star Soror. <laughs> of uh, the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And um, yes, I, I proudly wear my letters. Thank you. <laughs> That's curls. right. Yes. That's right. And so you are everything, okay, that Sora Ethel intended, okay? <laughs> we say that from time to time on here, you are everything that she intended. Well, thank you. You are too, ma'am. Thank you. So um, let's see. Where should we start? Well, you know what? I know where we can start. Please tell us about yourself and your journey from, you know, the from Lake Drive, <laughs> right, all the way to Director Bryant. So um, I'm Kanisha Bryant now, formerly Kanisha Williams, and grew up in the 89 blocks of East St. Louis, Illinois. Um, and I've always wanted to be a doctor from when I can actually remember, um, probably since about the age of five. Mm -hmm. And um, God 
graced me with parents who were educators. Um, uh, my parents passed on, but they were so instrumental in my journey um, in life uh, as first and foremost believers and pastors and then educators. My father was a principal, my mother was a school teacher, and they have just always instilled in myself and my siblings that, and anybody who actually crossed their paths mm -hmm. that you can be anything you actually want to be. And they firmly believe that and they instill that into me. And it's something mm -hmm. that to this day, I know it has pushed me forward to do everything that I set my mind to do. And so I thank God first and foremost for giving me to them. And then I thank God for them, for their influence on my life. So, so there was high school mm -hmm. and then there was Penn State. Penn State, yes. And so you got your bachelor's degree from Penn State and then went on to medical school where? At the University of Illinois. <laughs> the shameless plug for University of <laughs> Illinois. Uh huh. Yes, yeah, so I got my medical degree from University of Illinois at Chicago. And then I went on to do my um, general surgery residency at the University of Illinois Metropolitan Group Hospitals Program in Chicago, Illinois. And then I went on to a breast um, surgical oncology fellowship at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Now that was, uh, I clearly remember that because we were so excited and just so happy for you to be a Mayo Fellow. Yes. And that was an amazing time for you. So what exactly, so after you finished your residency, then you moved on. Yes. And that was in Chicago. After, yes, after I finished my fellowship, mm -hmm. I, moved, I moved back to Chicago and started my practice as a breast surgeon in the Chicagoland area. Um, my first position was um, um, a breast surgeon at a community hospital um, where I served there for 10 years. And then I've since moved on to where I um, provide services now um, at Advent Health in the Hinsdale and Grange, Illinois community. And I serve as medical director of breast surgery there. Um, I'm a part of the Advent Health Cancer Institute where we um, offer a multidisciplinary um, overall cancer program for patients, um, especially women um, and breast cancer. Okay. So I know you said from five years old that you wanted to be a doctor, mm -hmm. but why medicine? So past five years when you know you're uh, in college and you're in medical, why did you choose medicine? Well, it actually, um, it, it started when I was very young and so I just held on to the dream. So um, my grandmother, actually lived in Lovejoy, Illinois, and she happened to undergo a, an open heart surgery. And she came home with wounds that I could visibly see and so uh, that I could see. And I said, when, and she explained to me that the doctors had taken some things out of her legs and placed them in her heart and basically replaced everything. And I said, somebody did that, Granny? <laughs> and she was like, yes, ma'am. And I said, I wanna do, and they yeah. saved, and she said they saved her life. So I wanted to save lives first and foremost, but I wanted to do it in the way that those doctors had opened my granny up and put her back together. And so um, that's what started my journey or my desire to become a doctor and then also a surgeon. Okay. So, And there are many, obviously, there are many um, types of surgeons or, or disciplines rather. Mm -hmm. So why breast health and oncology? Well, um, first off, um, women, you know, is my passion um, to help women. Yes, we um, are. Actually, um, some statistics during medical school and throughout my residency and training, um, the, the staggering statistics is that breast cancer um, oftentimes flip back and forth, but more recently and more the most recent years is the number one leading cancer in women, meaning the incidence is highest um, um, in, in terms of all of the cancers um, for women and especially for black women as well. So if I could use my um, training to help and serve women, I wanted to do so. So that's what kind of curved that enthusiasm or um, 
actually um, brought about my desire to, to become a breast surgeon. So that was early on in medical school and training. So I can say for sure that that we are obviously your your passion. Kanisha, Dr. Brian, I'm sorry, we put respect on people's names here at Pearls and Politics <laughs> Podcast. Dr. Bryant has always kept me together, her family together, her friends together. I mean, even people who, you know, men, my brother has faced challenges and, you know, other men in my life have faced challenges throughout the years. And I can always call Dr. Bryant. I can, no matter what time of day, no matter what she has going on, you have such a heart for people, for God's people, and your ministry is just one of the most dynamic I've seen. Now, obviously, you know, I have two doctors that are close to me, you mm -hmm. and then, of course, Chastity's husband. But, you know, obviously you are closest. And to just have watched your journey from 15 mm -hmm. to where we are today and to just watch how no matter what has come your way, you've been able to just master and in excellence, and like you said, with grace. So just to watch and to hear when we talk about our day, and I'm talking about, oh, well, this case or this circumstance or this situation, and you just listen, and then you're like, oh, well, this happened today, and you know, and just to see the care, the level of care and concern that you have for people who are experiencing health challenges. Um, it's just amazing to watch. And that's why I'd be like, my best friend better than everybody's best friend, because you know, my she snatches cancer and takes care of people. Um, so we've already discussed this is always where you saw yourself. Mm -hmm. So we don't even have to ask that question because so many times we ask that of people because they're like, this is, I thought I was going to be a, you know, mm -hmm. astronaut, but here I am, you know, a surgeon, but you've always wanted to do that. So what are some of the, um, the challenges that you face in terms of uh, breast cancer and, and your patients and just navigating that space, you know, from dealing with people who are in such challenging circumstances? So um, I, first of all, um, dealing with women and especially women and women who have cancer can be one of the most disruptive things that may happen to someone. And I don't mean just that person, but as we know, women are the caretakers of the family. They take care of the husbands, they take care of the children. Um, oftentimes with the women that I'm dealing with, mostly they're taking care of their parents and they're heavily involved with family and friends and they also have careers and jobs. So when a woman is faced with a new diagnosis of breast cancer, the most challenging thing, believe it or not, that I have to do is to get the woman to understand that I need her to actually focus on herself and her own self-care, which is oftentimes quite difficult for most women. And so if I tell them to prioritize themselves for, for a little time, um, it becomes a little bit of a challenge. But after you know um, some information and letting them know that they're going to be okay because the majority of women are actually okay. The survival rate of most breast cancer patients is actually high. Um, not to say that it's not still something that we're fighting to you know, find and be curative for all breast cancer um, patients, but it is something that once they grab a hold of that hope and that information that they will prioritize themselves for the time set before them and then they actually um, set out to be to fight the good fight and they come out victorious most of the time I will say that so your practice you said is located um, in Illinois yes and when someone you know feels that they may have a concern so whether it comes from their OB guy and mm -hmm. or, or whether they're doing their self exams which we'll get into mm -hmm. um, at a later time they come to you, how are they typically referred to you? Well, most of the time I, I receive most of my referrals from uh, ob gynees or actually family practitioners or internists, um, primary care physicians. Um, most of the time, um, it's something that's picked up on a screening mammogram, and we'll talk about that a little later, hopefully. Um, and or it's a symptom that someone had that alerted their primary care physician to obtain some diagnostic imaging 
and possibly a biopsy. And by the time they reach me, sometimes they've had the biopsies, other times they have not. Mm -hmm. um, we are forging ahead with um, finding out more information and staging their cancer and, and then treating them and coming up with a treatment plan. Okay. So they go from noticing themselves or like you said, their PCP or their ob and then they come see you. So what should they look for when it comes to picking a Dr. Bryant? Because of course we know that not everyone is going to be in the Illinois area or the Chicagoland area, but if you are, um, and so how, what should they look for when it comes to that? Because that's something really important. Like people talk about, oh, you know, make sure you, you pick the right lawyer. No, you need, in addition to that, you need to pick the right doctor in any circumstance. So we often ask people what people should look for in finding someone good to take care of whatever their issue is. So if there is a situation, um, how do they pick the proper caregiver in a situation like this? So if you happen to have a, a primary care physician, then usually they'll refer you to someone that they trust their patients with and trust the care of their patients in. So um, typically the PCPs or the ob gynees will have a breast surgeon or general surgeon who focuses on breast to start the treatment process for breast cancer patients. Um, if you don't happen to have your PCP and you're just now meeting a PCP or you're just now meeting an ob and you have a problem with your breasts, um, one of the things you can do is look up breast surgeons. Um, as I stated, general surgeons take care of most of the patients in America. Um, but if you're in a metropolis, large city area, then most of the time you're going to be able to find someone who actually specializes in breast health care. So a breast surgeon, if you will Google, you can actually Google breast surgeons or breast cancer doctors, and oftentimes you'll find a breast surgeon in your local area. Now, we've discussed in, in prior conversations how um, certain people you recommend have a Dr. Bryant. We had that conversation even about myself. So um, obviously, you know, I have no problem with the transparency that in 2020, I had a mammogram and I ultimately had to have a biopsy. And thankfully, the biopsy, we will for, be forever grateful, was benign. But in keeping me together, you encouraged me to find a breast specialist here. So why... What would you tell our viewers in terms of who needs, even in the greatest of situations when it's benign um, or in the situations where it's not and healing comes, what are the circumstances and situations where somebody needs a caregiver that is you in addition to their PCP, in addition to their ob -GYN? So in spite of the fact that biopsies come back benign or your imaging may actually let's say a woman has a lump and she goes on to have imaging and diagnostic imaging and that imaging was negative. It doesn't mean that we dismiss the lump because they didn't see it on imaging. So that's one of the instances where someone still needs to seek out a surgeon who, who cares for breast. Um, and I say that because as I said, general surgeons and breast surgeons alike take care of patients with breast issues. But if you're fortunate enough to find a breast surgeon, you find a breast surgeon because sometimes masses are not identifiable on imaging, but yet they still need to be biopsied. Oftentimes masses that are biopsies, biopsied and benign, they still may require excision or to have the area removed. So these are reasons why someone, although they may not have a cancer diagnosis, may still warrant a breast surgery referral. So you also um, are responsible for or give care for more than just breast cancer, so breast health in general. And so I think so many times when we think of breast care or breast health, we always think breast cancer. But there are many other diagnoses and many other um, health concerns that you address in your practice. Absolutely. So everything from uh, nursing mothers who may have issues with mastitis or yeah. um, benign lumps that are found um, 
pain that people experience in their breasts, nipple discharge, and other skin issues that may happen with on in the breast area. Um, abnormal lymph nodes, these are all things that a breast surgeon would address. Um, but more importantly than those symptoms or things that may actually be wrong, um, I oftentimes care for women who are at high risk for breast cancer development as well. Um, if you have family members who have had breast cancer, there's something called a risk assessment. And we would actually categorize you as an average risk for breast cancer versus a high risk for breast cancer. And those that are deemed high risk need special care and attention above and beyond an annual screening mammogram that starts at 40. Um, our high risk patients, we would actually start sooner than 40. And we may add additional imaging that's not necessarily um, um, mammogram, but we may, on top of mammograms, not omitting mammograms, just wanted to make that very clear, we will never omit mammograms, but also have additional imaging um, as an adjunct to a, to a mammogram. And so um, high-risk patients are a huge part of my patient um, uh, population as well. So um, also, and, and risk does not mean that you are carrying a gene for breast cancer. Okay. Um, that's just one of the categories that may place you in a high risk for breast cancer is um, if you know or someone in your family has been diagnosed with an abnormal gene mutation that causes breast cancer, mm -hmm. then you yourself may need to be tested or you may have to have that risk assessment where someone actually is looking out for you in a preventative fashion in order to possibly avoid having breast cancer. So those, these are all reasons, benign things, from, like I said, mastitis all the way up to high risk, um, I would address in my practice. And I am um, painfully familiar with mastitis. <laughs> Having breastfed three children, um, I've had many bouts with mastitis, and it is one of the most painful things I've ever Absolutely. experienced. So um, to know that sometimes, you know, women let it go so long that you have to see them, um, I can't imagine the, the, the pain behind that. But it's amazing, again, the level of your practice, because again, if you are typically healthy and don't usually have, you know, health concerns or issues, again, when we think breast, we think cancer. We don't think discharge or abscesses or mastitis. We think, oh, well, we're only dealing with you know the scariest of situations mm -hmm. and there's a myriad of other health concerns um, that need to be addressed when it comes to breast health. So we often talk about um, the challenges that we face in terms of um, being African-American, being women, being professionals. Have you faced challenges being a, a doctor of color? And Absolutely. then of course, you add to it being an African-American woman that's a doctor in your field. So have you faced challenges during this time that you've been operating in excellence and doing all the things that you're doing, saving lives? Are there still challenges in that? Yes. Um, the challenges that I face as first a black female doctor, um, you know, they are ongoing um, and they're, they're pervasive. Um, oftentimes I'm not seen as the doctor when I enter a room in a hospital, um, unless I'm wearing an actual doctor's coat or um, a label or a name tag that says doctor. And even still, they'll still assume um, that I am oftentimes not the doctor. Um, it's not offensive to me because I'm so gracious, graciously grateful for all of the ancillary staff that work in hospitals. So, and they have a huge part in patient care. So, mm -hmm. it's not offensive to me. Um, but I under I do am, and am consciously aware that you know mm -hmm. they're not assuming that I am the doctor. 
Um, but beyond that, as um, time goes on, you get more comfortable and, and you are, um, your reputation has started to come about in the area that you are, they may recognize me. So I don't have too much of that anymore. However, um, the level of care um, that is expected as a black woman um, from patients, it has to be superb. It has to be over and beyond. Um, or else they will think that you're pretty much not capable of taking care of them. Um, and it's just, um, I think it's the challenges that we all face as black female professionals. That's mm -hmm. just what we face um, in terms of what people will assume our abilities are. I'll just leave it at that. Um, but um, the challenges also it, uh, include um, you know, your colleagues and how they may mishandle or mistreat you um, based on what their expectations of you may be. Um, all in all, it's just another opportunity for God to allow his grace to shine and his mm -hmm. favor to go before you and you um, remaining humble, just extend the level of care and excellence that you that you're meant to give. That's all. And I think that's one of the beautiful things, you know, about you and about all four of our journeys is that we, by his grace, as you stated, have been able to navigate the challenges. Um, and it hasn't been all challenges, right? We've, we've really managed to be able to um, excel in many areas professionally and to just be able to, what did you say? Your gifts have made room for you is what we say. So with everything that you do and everything that you have going on, how do you balance family, life, and being a doctor? Well, because um, you are super mom. Now we, we, we're not going to take nothing away from that. So how do you manage family, life, and being Dr. Bryant? Um, so just take it day by day. That's all you can do. <laughs> That's all we can do. That's all, you That's can all do. we can do. <laughs> um, you know, just take it one day at a time. Um, I try and focus on work while I'm at work. Mm -hmm. I've learned that that helps tremendously. Mm -hmm. um, and if I can avoid bringing work home, then I'll, I'll try to do so. Um, but um, it's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle, I'm mm -hmm. going to say. And I have my challenges because... Um, you know, with everything, like you said, that's going on, there's always something going on. And um, I just take it one step at a time, try to focus on what I'm focusing on at work. And when I get home, I try and give my children the um, priority the you. and, mm -hmm. you know, the attention that they need and care for. And you, you know, it, just because you're a doctor mom doesn't mean you're not faced with all of the things that all moms are faced with homework, um, you know, soccer games, mm -hmm. dance, <laughs> rehearsal and classes, everything. You still have all of those things to manage. But, you know, um, you know, going through medical school and you know, residency, oftentimes what comes with that is a lot of time, man, you learn early on, you have to manage your time, you know, efficiently and effectively. So basically, um, you know, just being present when you're with people that mm -hmm. you care about, it goes a long way um, with my children, obviously, and talking about that, but even with family and friends and beyond. And, um, you know, I think that we all, as professional women, have that struggle. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I've been blessed with family and friends who are gracious. If I'm not available to be like 100% attentive or if I'm, I will fall asleep on anybody at any given <laughs> no, time. Not. But if you I'm are tired. so present, though. Like, <laughs> I, I kid you not, you are present. And I think that just ties into who God created you to be, because mm -hmm. whether, you know, it just you're present as a doctor and you're attentive and you're present as a friend and you're present as a mom. But you, like I said, I can call you anytime about anything and you, you are absolutely present. And so that's awesome. So you have tried to navigate that mm -hmm. and your job can be stressful emotionally. Right. Yes. And so how do you, 
how do you keep yourself mentally and emotionally and psychologically healthy when you have to, you know, of course there's the, yay, your remission and it's gone. And, you know, but then there's the initial conversation where the person, the first time they come in contact with you is stage four, or it's a rare aggressive, but you have to relay this information and you take that on. So outside of, you know, uh, venting, outside of the Peloton, of uh, how do you manage that after all these years of caring for others? Well, um, delivering the news can oftentimes be, I would say, the, the largest challenge. The other piece of it, as I spoke earlier, is to get the women to kind of focus on themselves for a bit. But, um, you know, in delivering difficult news, you have to be honest with people, okay? And so first and foremost, honesty about where we are, what stage they are in the prognosis is always key. But I'm a believer first before I'm a doctor. And so where there is hope, there is going to be hope given to these patients and these women. And so I oftentimes will convey that there is a chance, even with stage four breast cancer, of survival. And oftentimes we are successful and there are times when we're not. But if we can extend hope and, you know, I'm constantly praying for my, but you asked me how I did and how I deal with the emotional side of, I stay prayed up. That's what it is, God. That's how, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the mm -hmm. only way. Um, you know, I, I think of a time where, um, you know, all of my patients at the beginning of my practice used to be older than me. I would say the vast majority of them were. Um, and now, sadly, a lot of my patients are very much so younger than myself. And so the most difficult patient that I've had to tell was a 24-year-old young lady. And she was with her mother and her grandmother. And it was so difficult to let them all know that we were actually dealing with breast cancer. And so, um, you know, sometimes when it's, you know, ex as shocking as that was in that very young lady, you know, sometimes I have to step out of the room and say, okay, <laughs> okay, All right, Lord. Lord. <laughs> you don't right, have Lord. to help me get through this because we both can't be in there struggling and crying and, and doing things, but, um, he graces me to be able to do it. And so um, we get through it. And, you know, I can say the day that that patient, that 24-year-old is cancer-free and she's a survivor and she's alive and kicking and she actually has a baby now. So, you know, um, God is good, you know, and, and God works through medicine. And so, um, you know, I'm just grateful to be a part of it. That's all. And we are so grateful that you are a part of it. I'm grateful. Your patients are grateful. Your family and friends, your community is grateful. Um, you definitely are, like I said, everything, F Sora Ethel intended, everything, your mother and father, who we love dearly, intended, everything that your siblings and, you know, just everybody around you, you are everything that, um, you are the best things that uh, God intended. And so we thank you for coming on today, for sharing your knowledge and your expertise. Um, it is because of a lack of knowledge that the people perish. And we don't ever want people to be without knowledge or understanding because here at Pearls of Politics Podcast, we want people healthy in every area of their lives. So thank you so much for tuning in today to Pearls and Politics Podcast. We thank you so much for tuning in. We will see you next week as we continue our series on breast cancer. Thank you. Thank you.